Welcome to Rise, a show celebrating the artistic, cultural, and economic rebirth of Buffalo. I'm Joe Macy. And I'm Lisa Christie. Joe and I couldn't be more excited to be with you today. With us in the studio is fellow Buffalonian and Tony-nominated actor Stephen McKinley Henderson. Stephen stars with Denzel Washington in August Wilson's Oscar-nominated Fences. He's also currently appearing in another Oscar-nominated film, Manchester by the Sea. Stephen has performed on stage at Buffalo Studio Arena, as well as on television and on Broadway, where he was Tony nominated for his role in Fences. We are thrilled to have him on the show today. And also with us on the show today is Western New Yorker artist Philip Burke, an international star of the art world. Philip's work has been seen around the globe, from the pages of Rolling Stone and Atlantic magazines, to being celebrated in art galleries all over the world. We are happy to have you with us here on Rise. We'll be right back. If he be like you in the sports, he gonna be all right. Ain't but two men ever played baseball good as you. And what did it ever get me? I ain't got a... Welcome back to Rise. Stephen McKinley Henderson is a star of stage, television, and screen, where he's currently appearing in the Oscar-nominated films Manchester by the Sea and August Wilson's Fences. On television, Stephen has also starred on the hit shows Law & Order, Elementary, and Blue Buds. He was nominated for a Tony for his role in Fences, which was adapted into a feature film by Denzel Washington, and has been nominated for four Oscars, including Best Picture of the Year. We are thrilled to have Stephen here today. Stephen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad. What a year you've had. Yeah, yeah. It's been, uh, it's been fun. Two Oscar-nominated films. Uh, Got to congratulate you on the Virtuoso Award most recently. Uh, thank you. That was a joy down in Santa Barbara. And, and it was presented by uh, Christopher Lloyd. Oh, wow. And I've been a fan of his for a long time, and yeah. we had great conversation down there. I watched it online. You were in some really good companies. Some yeah, big, big, big yeah, names yeah. six Oscar nominees. Wow. Yeah, Wonderful. yeah. I got to say, you, I mean, this is a compliment. You may be the most famous but unrecognizable celebrity in Buffalo. Uh -huh. But I don't think that's the case anymore. I mean, uh, you're becoming very, very recognizable. Was that intended? Well, <laughs> no, well, yeah, yeah. I tell you, I'm glad I got a lot of years in where I could just go get a get a hot dog at Ted's and not have to get <laughs> not, not anymore. No, no, yeah, not much more. Now, but, most so. people don't realize this, but you played uh, Troy Max and Denzel's character on stage here in, at Studio at Arena Studio in 1992. Arena. I certainly did. But then did. again, you played Jim Bono in 2010. So how is that like adjusting to both characters? Did oh, what's well, a joy. I mean, it's both written by August Wilson. Yeah. Did and you find yourself in uh, the movie Fences feeding Denzel some of his lines? When no, he no, no. <laughs> never needed to do that. Never needed to do that. But what was it like? I mean, you've been in how many of August Wilson's? Plays? I've been in eight of the ten. Eight of the ten, the Pittsburgh cycle, they're called. Exactly. I mean, it's the a Pittsburgh Pulitzer cycle, Prize. and some call it the American Century cycle. People in Pittsburgh call it the Pittsburgh cycle. Right, right. So you got to know him well. Yes, yes, I got to know August well. It was really quite a blessing in my life. That, was I'm, he a good friend? Yes, I, I, you know, he tried always to make me feel very comfortable around him, but I was always in awe. But, uh, but we relax sometimes, and then, and then he'd say something, and I'd realize, I'm talking with this genius, you know. <laughs> but he was also your mentor, correct? Well, you know, we, we, we got to know each other quite late in life, and we both had a mentor in common. Mm. And uh, so, but I mean, you know, uh, I was, uh, was in my 50s when I met him, mm -hmm. and as was he. Uh, so uh, I met him down in Pittsburgh, and uh, we just, just got along really great. And uh, then I got cast in one of his plays, and... Did that for eight years. Uh, did well. Did uh, Jitney for six years. The uh, play that's now on Broadway, mm -hmm. uh, because we, it was the only of, play of the ten plays that didn't go to Broadway at right. first. So it was a badge of honor. But now Ruben Santiago Hudson from Lackawanna, he's got that one. Wow. He's directed, and it's on Broadway. Wow. So I'm glad. We rejoice in that. Now, you're a big civil rights advocate, correct? And uh, you've won an NAACP award. Out of all the stage and, and film you've done, what has hit closest to home as far as your characters you played? Well, you know, I mean, I've, I received an NAACP award for acting mm -hmm. uh, in, in, uh, in Jitney. But of the roles I've played, you know, I know it's, it's so difficult because they all are part of you. You know, I mean, yeah. you're always using your fingerprint, your DNA right. for, for all of it. But I did a play that won the Pulitzer uh, in 2015 called Between Riverside and Crazy, won the Pulitzer for uh, Stephen Adley Gerges. Wow. And, uh, uh, and I won an Obie Award for that. And uh, that was one that I felt rather close to, uh, not, and not because he crafted it on me or anything, mm -hmm. 
but because finally uh, it spoke to me in a very deep way. Well, this role was a great fit. Jim Bono, so what's it like to now finally bring August Wilson's uh, art to a big screen, to a whole new audience? Well, you know, because of the leadership. See, right. leadership is everything. And Denzel, right. uh, that's, it makes it so special. And the fact that August wrote this play and wanted this movie to be made, and it took 30 years to do it. Yeah. And then the perfect storm of Denzel Washington, Viola Davis, Michael T. Williamson, Russell Hornsby, Giovanna Depo, and Sonia Sidney, to be a part of that and do it in Pittsburgh, yeah. in the town that inspired him. I mean, it just doesn't get much better. Than Any that. funny you, stories from the set? Oh, well, <laughs> I, I can't tell all that. that. <laughs> I can't tell all that. But I tell you, though, the, the citizens of Pittsburgh yeah. who welcomed us to the Hill District, and it's a place in the Hill District called Sugar Top. So we're at Sugar Top in the Hill District, and all the people you see on the streets, they're all Pittsburghians. Or, mm -hmm. And um, uh, Denzel went to each door in that neighborhood, knocked on the door, said, we're going to be in your neighborhood for a wow, while. really? And I'm going to be trying to do the best movie I can. Oh, personal. And so to see those people welcome us, and they were so glad to see Viola there every day with her apron, and, and they would bring food for us and everything. Yeah. So. What a great it's a great city. My daughter was a school there. It's very Buffalo-like. They're good people. Yes, great. yes. It's a beautiful city. So. Now, um, Viola Davis, we talked about, I mean, she's like mimicking this Meryl Streep type career. She's really, really impressive, and she yeah. nails this role. Oh, she does. And, and, and Meryl's a big fan of there, really? there, yeah. there, there's a mutual admiration society between those two women. Yeah, I'm expecting some awards for her. Now, I have a question for you. Your, your family has a very special story. Your brother was deaf. And how did that impact and change your life? Well, um, my, I had an aunt in Oklahoma who, uh, who wanted to help my brother go to a, a school for the deaf because mm -hmm. he had been going to regular schools and not doing very well, and they made fun of him and so on and so forth. So she had us go around these churches doing uh, the Lord's Prayer in the 23rd Psalm. He was 12 and I was 7. Wow. And I would, you know, speak the, the Lord's Prayer in the 23rd Psalm and he would sign it. And they would just, just throw money at us. We had enough money for candy and for him to go to school. Oh, Have you wow. learned sign language? Well, I had just that much sign because I didn't grow up with my right. parents. We didn't grow up in the same household. Oh, okay. We only got together when we went, when my grandfather would take us to Oklahoma. That's so so I had a pretty much a seven, seven year old's uh, vocabulary on my hands, but I, I did know the alphabet, so. So as far as performing, do you think that sparked the actor in you? Oh, no question about yeah. that. Yeah, because he was such an inspiration because of this, that intent that he had to use that to take his life further. So I saw very early on the super objective, saw very early on the commitment yeah. and a passion. So tell us, take us back, tell us how and when and, and where Buffalo came to fruition. Well, uh, th theater again, you know, right. I got a chance to uh, be cast in a production of, um, of, uh, of Mice and Men. Okay. That was the first show. That. Got to do Of Mice and Men here because of the gentleman who took over as artistic director had run a theater in St. Louis, and I was a member of that company for five, six years. And then when he came here, he um, offered me one show, which turned into another show. And then I met the great Saul Elkin, wow. and, uh, and there was a position open at the University of Buffalo. Yeah. And so after about four years of coming once a year to do a play. What year was this about University of Buffalo? Uh, 87. Because you're a professor. You just retired just actually retired in 2016. Just retired after wow, 29, 30 years of being a professor So you there. did your whole tenure. You started. Yeah. So did I you did come the... back? Were you full time or you just came back? Oh, full time. Yeah, oh, wow. no, I, I was full time. In, uh, uh, Great years, great, great years. And I know you've won a lot of awards. You've been recognized for a lot of awards. The Art Voice uh, for Outstanding Performance. Oh, you really do know. Uh, <laughs> Niagara Gazette, I was Googling the heck out of it. Niagara Gazette, <laughs> you even know about that. It was, yes, that was. So we are so honored and proud to have you here in Buffalo. You've been just oh, an well, amazing Oh, it's great to be a part of you guys as you set out on this wonderful journey. All right, well, speaking of Buffalo and UB, tell us, what is it like? what is your advice to these young students? And, and, mm -hmm. and how do you, I mean, what's our landscape like as future uh, well I mean you know talent. there's wonderful the wonderful things going on here especially in film sure. uh, but there's always been a great theater community here you got oh, yes. world-class theater here yeah. the People Irish know classical Cavanoke Road Less Traveled oh uh, I mean uh, uh, Buffalo United Arts uh, the, the African Culture Center Ujima it's a rich history oh man and you work with a lot of the students once you're done teaching them a lot of them well you know and, and if they ever call you know they want to work on an audition or something okay. like that you know always but I always tell them 
work on the craft. He's available in Buffalo, people. <laughs> yeah, right. Work on the craft. And but they're great teachers here, Greg Natale, and uh, so I'm just glad to be a part of a community that prizes the arts as much so as people, Buffalo you, does. You don't have to take off to L.A. You don't have to go to New York City, or or you do to be the big star or the big, big, big Broadway Well, star. you know, I mean, I don't know about big star. I, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a working actor. I'm, sure. I'm glad to be. Uh, and uh, if you, you do what you, what you love. If you, the career you seek may elude you, but the craft you seek is in your hand. You can get as good at it as you want. We and, love and, those words of wisdom. Yeah, thank you. And we are so happy to have you on Rise today. Yes. Joe and I are just thrilled. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, it's been very special. It's been a great pleasure. Buffalo Treasure. Yeah. Thanks so much for being with us here on Rise. We're gonna be right back with Philip Burke. Welcome back to Rise. Artist Philip Burke is here with us in the studio. While his face might not be recognizable to you, we're sure that his work certainly will be. Philip is a world-renowned artist whose work has appeared in countless magazines, newspapers, and art galleries all over the world. His exclusive contract with Vanity Fair made it possible for Philip to come home to Buffalo, where he lives and works today. And his drawings and illustrations have appeared in Time, Newsweek, Sports Illustrated, The New York Times, and probably best known for Rolling Stone magazine. He was recognized by the Living Legacy Project at the Birchfield Penny Arts Center in 2013, and we're thrilled to have Philip here today. Philip, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. Yes. That's great. So, I mean, take us back. How, how and when and where were you when you found out about this incredible talent? Well, I started really seriously becoming interested in cartooning in high school. And at first it was political cartooning. Then I think when I was a sophomore in high school, I was introduced to the work of David Levine, who is considered to be the father of modern day caricature. And you may know his work, cross-hatching caricatures. And once I saw his work, it, was, it became something I couldn't not do. And so I got very serious at the age of 15, and I started doing work that was noticed as professional. And even the, I remember, I think it was the news, did an article on me at that time. So is this without professional or any type of formal training? Right. It was just looking at the work of David Levine and trying to do work that looked like it. And I remember when I had that article done, the old uh, editor for the news, Murray Light, told me at the time, you could make a good living at this. And from that point on, even though I tried to do other things in terms of studies or academics, in the back of my head it was always, well, it doesn't really matter because I know I just want to do caricature. And what age was this? You knew this was 15. Your 15 years old. Yeah, so, so what was the transition from uh, you decided to stay close? Uh, you went to Toronto University? Yes. Actually, the reason I went to Toronto because it was a way to live away from home very cheaply. Oh. There was this, like this period of time where, as an American, you could go to the St. Michael's College for the amount that it would cost a Canadian. I don't know how that worked, but it was, for me, kind of a way to be on my own without the responsibility of truly being on my own. Right. I went with the idea of going for academics, art history, English, but so, I took more interest in doing caricatures so for the... So what led you to New York City? Well, New York City is where every artist had to go back then. Right. So this was, I went to New York in 77, mm -hmm. but back then you couldn't even get into the field of caricature or editorial illustration without being in New York. Is that where you were introduced to Vanity Fair? Yes, actually. But it, start, it all started with me going to New York. Mm -hmm. I think I had like $100 in my pocket. I really didn't know anybody. It was a different time and a, diff, you know, a different place. But back then, you could go into a magazine shop, mm -hmm. look at magazines, look at the art director, call them up and get an appointment the next day. So I just uh, took my work all around, and left-leaning publications started to use me right away. And actually, I got work right away from New York Times, Time Magazine, just as somebody who was doing caricature that was fresh. But it was the Village Voice that kept me going back in the early days. So what is the work. process from start to finish when you get commissioned for a job, say with uh, Vanity Fair? The, the first thing is trying to find out everything I can about the person that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And usually when I did work for Vanity Fair, it would be political. So at that time that I was doing a lot of work for Vanity Fair, 
I was kind of a political junkie too. I was always checking out what was happening politically. So, and then trying to find pictures. Usually publications will supply me with some photos, but back then it was a little trickier trying to get photos. Now, nowadays, you know, now what happens is once I get an assignment, I'll go to Google and I'll go to YouTube, okay. and I'm able to get so much reference. So how do you decide? I'm not an artist, but look, I can look at any one of your photos and immediately identify who that person is. It's, it's a caricature with a twist. I mean, how do you decide, you know, um, the, neck, the neck width or the neck length and the twist and the, the 3D dimensions? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> I'm going to try to answer that. Actually, I, my goal is always to try to get the inside by picturing the outside. And I learned early on that if I'm true to what I'm looking at, even if I'm stretching it, the inside comes out. But actually, it's not a particular feature I'm focused on. I'm basically, I'm caricaturing or trying to bring out the personality through all the features. And it is a pretty intense process. It starts with very, very, very straight drawings. And I'll do each profile. I'll do each three-quarter. And these drawings could take an hour, two, three hours. You made Joe, uh, The Rise, that's one of our favorites, your work, when you did Joe Macy in 2003. It's one of my favorites. But you made him look balanced and normal, as opposed to Garcia, Jerry Garcia, that, that two-dimensional yes. face. Interesting. Well, for example, with the Jerry Garcia, you almost can't do him without getting some kind of reference to tripping. So okay. that was kind of my oh, peering sense. into that. <laughs> Actually, when I look at the Jerry Garcia painting, it all happens in the moment, it all happens spontaneously, but looking at it after it was done, definitely I felt like I was successful in capturing kind of the bizarre quality and also the two different sides. Well, we love your work. Yeah. Now, most people don't know that you were born and raised in Tonawanda and that you've just somehow, you're an international artist. I, I'm sure you travel a lot, but how have you balanced work and family? Tell us about your family. Well, let's see. Now you met your wife? Yeah. Um, after being in New York, I went to New York when I was 21, and after being there for almost six years, getting myself started, mm -hmm. simultaneous with getting an exclusive contract with Vanity Fair, I met a woman on a trip back home who, I, it was love at first sight, and also she was pioneering a movement of practice of true Buddhism. And I fell in love with both right away. And um, I waited for nine months in New York for her to come and she wouldn't. And so I, it was a combination of things, but I just realized, you know, what's more important, where I am or who I'm with? And mm -hmm. so I came back here and never regretted it. So what, as far as practicing Buddhism, do you travel a lot? Do you, are you really deeply into the practice? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Um, actually, after being in New York for six years, mm -hmm and realizing that my caricatures were never going to change the world politically or any other way. When I met this Buddhism, it really became a true purpose. I mean, I, I was living in New York during the punk days, during the Reagan era. I had mm -hmm. pretty much given up, for several reasons, given up hope in a lot of ways in my life. But when I met this Buddhism and saw how I would be able to change my life and have a good positive influence on the people around me, it became more the driving force, whereas before everything was art. Mm -hmm. Now the art, in a sense, served. So it's like a balance between the two. Does it change the way you've done art now? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. as a matter of fact, um, when I look back over the years of my work, I saw the first change was that I stopped being so critical. Mm -hmm. And then I started to see that my work, in my work I could see I was portraying different sides of people instead of you know one-sided. But as time went on, I hope that my work reflects humanity in the sense that when you look at someone mm -hmm. that I've done, when you look at the painting, you see the distortion sometimes and the wild colors, but my goal is that you also see something of yourself and that the paintings reflect the person's humanity. And you, do, you still must be spending some time in New York. I mean, Rolling Stone, Time, Vogue. I mean, you've got to be going back and forth quite a bit. No, actually, for this kind of business, you really don't have no. to. And I was one of the first artists to leave that far from New York back in the 80s and start sending sketches by fax and then started sending, packaging my paintings. 
but very quickly it became a kind of thing where the, if your work was something they wanted, they come after it. But so I do go to New York. Who, have, who haven't you done? I mean, you've done almost everybody. Who haven't you done that you really wanted? <laughs> it's a great list. Um, yeah, it's hard to find somebody that I haven't done. Um, or met, or what funny story might you have? Uh, <laughs> How about what's next? What's, Any new portraits you're painting? Um, right now I'm working on a portrait of Kate Middleton. Mm -hmm. And that is more of a portrait. And actually the painting that I did of you, Joe, was more of a portrait. Right. So usually that's determined by who I'm doing, how wild and, and far out I get. Um, but you mentioned something about a story about meeting something, somebody that I painted. Yeah. The one that stands out the most is when I painted Andy Warhol. Yeah. And that was just an incredible experience for me. Well, we, that's... It had to be strange. I mean, it had to be... It was strange. <laughs> it was strange. Um, he was strange for sure, but he was very generous with his time and with his spirit. I had met him just because I was looking out my apartment window in the West Village, and I saw the hair, and I recognized who it was, and I ran outside. Um, <laughs> this was... I was early 20s back, or mid 20s back then, I was just in everybody's face, didn't matter who it was, if I wanted something. And I just went up to him and said, my name's Philip Burke, I'd like to paint you. And I was shocked, because I figured he wouldn't know who I am. So did Andy Warhol actually sit for you? Yes, he did. He invited me to come to the factory anytime. It took me a year to get up the courage to do it, and I was a nervous wreck. But he sat for about four and a half hours. Luckily, my wife was with me, talking to him the whole time. And when I finished the painting, he looked at it and said, oh, looks just like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Philip, listen, thank you very much for joining us. Yes, My you. pleasure. Appreciate it's time. wonderful to be here. We will be back with more Rise. That brings our show to a close. We'd like to thank you for joining us and hope to see you again. And our thanks to our guests, Stephen McKinley Henderson and Philip Burke. We hope to bring you more about what's new and being celebrated in Buffalo. Until next time, be well and thank you for watching RISE.